Great. Good afternoon, everyone. It's 4 o'clock, so we're going to be getting started. Thank you for joining us for this CTD webinar. Um, we are pleased to welcome Rupal Patel, PhD, speech scientist and technologist. She's going to be discussing uh, bespoke, bespoke Voices, um, empowering personal and social self-identity for those who rely on speech generating devices to communicate. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Rupal so that she can go ahead and get started. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining in. Um, my name is Rupal Patel, and I'm the founder and CEO of Vocal ID, and um, also a professor at Northeastern University. Um, I'm going to have the I'm going to turn the webcam off in a few minutes. And just go through the slides, and then we have uh, a considerable amount of time at the end for questions that I'd love to take as well. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and, and uh, turn this off now and switch over to the slides. Okay. So as I said, um, I, um, I am the founder of, uh, uh, and CEO of Vocal ID. And what I want to talk about today is the science and the underlying technology uh, that was initially developed in my laboratory at Northeastern University where I'm a professor in the Departments of Communication Sciences and Disorders and Computer and Information Science. And that gave rise to Vocal ID. Um, and the, the underlying technologies of, of relevance to assistive technology, which is what we're talking about today, um, and I want to delve deeper into the science of speech production and how that impacts um, the ability to make custom voices for those who rely on assistive communication devices. I'm very excited to announce that we will be launching our bespoke voices as well as our vocal legacy voices later this year in 2016. And I want to tell you about how we create these custom digital voices. So um, each one of us has a unique voice. It's how people know us and it's how people remember us. Uh, all of our voices are not identical and in fact they are so much a part of who we are. They're our identities. And there's an evolutionary basis for why we all have unique voices. It may have begun with the fact that we needed a unique voice to signal danger or to um, even make mating calls, uh, to identify who it is amongst our species that we're communicating with, or those who are outside um, of our species or group, right? So there's a very, there's a key reason for why all of our voices are different from one another, and it, it goes far beyond the technology today that we're talking about. It really has a, a deep meaning in evolution and, and sort of development. At the very basic level, a unique voice allows us to identify the person that we are speaking with. And a familiar voice actually activates different parts of the brain. And a mother is able to, and even fathers, are able to identify the voice of their child from a sea of cries and voices or chatter. And so there's very good reasons for why voices are differentiated, the human voice being such an important integral part of our self-identity. And there are also a, a number of cultural and um, societal biases and norms that are associated with voices. We know from just a single hello over a telephone line that who the person is that's calling. We can even predict their age um, and gender. Uh, even what they might do in terms of their occupation or habits and personality just from their voice. And that's such a powerful piece of how we make connections with ourselves, but also with those who we know and love. Yet with all the advances um, in artificial intelligence voice activation that we hear about today, a compelling voice interface is really still sci-fi. You'll hear it in or you'll see um, movies such as Her or Ex Machina where the, where the characters are artificial characters that have these unique voices that people can even fall in love with. Yet we all know for those of us who are using uh, assistive technologies or who have uh, family and friends using assistive technologies that the voices on those devices is nowhere close to this sci-fi future. Um, and that's actually a real pain point for over 10 million people who are living with voicelessness and using these speaking devices to interact with the world around them. Until now, we've been giving them these uniform voices that don't fit their bodies or their personalities. 
And, and I think if you think about um, the fact that assistive technology has opened doors for people who have, with severe communication impairments, it's a significant leap forward. The fact that we have AAC is a significant leap forward from not having it, and that's only in the last 100 years. But given its roots in, medical, in the medical model, the focus of AAC up until now has really been on addressing the physical limitations of voicelessness. Um, now, there's an increased focus on the social model of disability, and it's important for us to start considering some of the personal factors, and the voice being one of them. You know, in the medical model, it, we're fixing or trying to fix the physical limitation of not being able to speak clearly. And so, giving someone a functional voice solution is, is important, and it sort of fixes that piece. But as you think about the social model, the social model considers other types of personal factors as well, the voice being a very important part of it. And I think it's only now that both technology is advanced and cultural expectations or societal expectations of how we should be thinking about disability has also advanced, that we can think about the entire aspect of the individual, not just their disability, but how that um, or can actually be seen as a feature rather than a bug. How do we create ways in which these individuals can have full lives and be accepted fully for who they are? And if we can harness some aspect of their voice, perhaps that allows them to engage more fully in society and also see themselves as full members of society, which they are. And so to only think about AAC as the successful transmission of information and basic information is to shortchange that person of their individual life situation. You know, two children who are using AAC in the classroom may have similar physical and cognitive uh, abilities, but they shouldn't, and they may even be using the same device, but they are unique individuals who have different voices. And so one of the things that struck me is the beginning of Vocal ID was back in 2002. Um, I was at an assistive technology conference uh, presenting my research on how people with severe communication impairments still have control over the melodic aspects of their voice. So familiar communication partners uh, can typically understand even most really impaired speech. And that's because there's some aspects of the voice that are still relatively preserved in people with severe communication disorders. And this is the work that I had done for my PhD, showing that there's preserved prosodic content, prosodic meaning, melodic aspects of speech are still, um, are still able to be controlled to a relative degree by people with communication impairments. But yet, right after giving that talk, I walked into an exhibit hall, and what I saw was a young girl and a grown man having a conversation using, the, using different devices, but the exact same voice. And what struck me was that I was hearing this voice from all around me. Um, you know, that perfect call voice at that time coming from everywhere. Literally hundreds of people using the same voice. Same. Am I hearing an echo? Um, well, in the so that the implication is really of a, a sea of uniform voices. Um, I don't know if I should turn off the... Uh, uh, the audio here. Are you all hearing echoes? I'm going to stop for a second. Okay, that's better. All right. Hope that, that will that will help us here. Uh, so, in 2002, the sea of uniform voices. What I saw and, and heard around me was really something that sparked uh, the beginnings of Vocal ID and the beginnings of a, a, a career or research line in this work. And I think the, the main thing that struck me was that having these this uniform voices really impeded um, social integration for people who use assistive communication. It impedes the ability for us to see the individual with the communication impairment um, as more capable rather than just looking at their disability. What I wanted, what I was seeing and what we were doing in our research was showing that even though the communication impairments had abilities that were preserved and that we could harness them, yet the AAC devices that we were giving them, at least the voice output, was still perpetuating that disability. Um, and I think it's not, you know, um, it's not a mystery why 
sometimes adoption of AAC, even though it gives us so much in terms of being able to communicate, why adoption rates aren't as high as we want them and why abandonment rates are so high. You know, I think that part of it is we haven't fully closed the loop on what this assistive technology should be doing for the individual. That it should be giving them something beyond just that functional solution. And so, um, you know, what, what set off there was the beginnings of, uh, of local ID back then. So what are, um, so in 2002, what I saw was something that really sparked the beginning of the next line of work that we were going to do. Some of the reasons why um, the voice, the similar voices were being used on assistive technology systems was because of an artifact of old research. Back in the 1970s and 80s, uh, it was shown that the adult male voice was the easiest to understand in, rever in reverberant voice, um, reverberant environments like a classroom. But classroom acoustics had changed over the decades, and yet clinical practice to fit people with the same adult male voice had not changed. And we needed to change that, right? We wouldn't dream of fitting a little girl with the prosthetic limb of a grown man. So why would we give them the same prosthetic voice? Um, and really, I think, but what are their options? Right now, the options for people with assistive technology needs um, really range in these two broad extremes. On the one end, there are these low-quality robotic voices that are based um, you know, on a model-based aspect of speech synthesis. And, and we don't really have that in AAC anymore, but we still hear that in the voices around us and other things that talk. And on the other end of the extreme are expensive, generic-sounding voices like Siri or Cortana. Our voices in AAC sit somewhere in between, yet they still are very generic. You know, to have about 70 voices across multiple languages and only a few options for kids really isn't sufficient to mark all the various different people that are using AAC around the world. So that's where we want to, wanted to innovate on, is we saw that there was an opportunity here uh, to move beyond what we had then. Okay, so how do we even begin? How do we begin to build custom-crafted vocal identities? Well. Um, because we, as a speech scientist, as trained as a speech scientist and a clinician, um, there's a theory of speech production called the source filter theory of speech production. So we actually leverage the source filter theory of speech production to a great degree to create our custom voices. And the source filter theory of speech production states that speech is a combination of the source, which are the vibrations of the vocal folds that make sound, right? Once the sound is then pushed through the rest of the vocal tract, which we call the filter, these are the chambers of your head and neck that take that sound that almost sounds like a, um, a, an electric razor. You take that sound and you, you turn it into consonants and vowels as you shape the two of the vocal tract into different shapes. And that's what speech is. It's this combination of source and filter. But there are also um, a number of uh, the, the people who have severe communication impairments have the ability to control the source of their sound, but the filter is impaired because they can't move the lips and the tongue in adequate ways to create a clearly discernible consonants and vowels. And so what we do in Vocal ID is we separate the source and the filter and take only the source characteristics of the person who is unable to speak and borrow the filter characteristics from someone who is similar in age and size and cultural and linguistic background. And when we combine them again, what we get is a voice that sounds as clear as the surrogate speaker, but is similar in vocal identity to the person who we want to create the voice for. So that's really the science behind vocal ID. And in 2014, um, I was able to talk about this work on a relatively big platform at TED, and that led to a lot of people saying that they wanted to contribute their voice to help people who were unable to speak. So I formed Vocal ID so that we could take the technology out of the laboratory and into the real world so that we could, do, we could create voices beyond just a few, thousand, a few dozen that we could do in the laboratory. And I took leave from the university um, in 2015 uh, to jump in full time to create uh, this company. I began by recruiting the best talent so that we could bring this vision um, to reality. I recruited first 
Jeff Meltzner, a leading um, speech scientist, a speech engineer with industry experience. Uh, Jeff and I had also collaborated on work in um, silent speech recognition. And also Michael Suen. Uh, Michael is a uh, talented um, UI UX designer, and he's really the, um, the brains behind a lot of the interface that you see in Vocal ID in terms of the voice recording platform as well. Our team is growing. Um, and uh, we have a, a number of people that are entrepreneurs as well as um, engineers who are built helping us create the technology as well as getting the word out to the people that could benefit. So what we first did in Vocal ID is we created a platform for people to be able to contribute their voice because this was an important piece about scaling the technology. In the laboratory, we had a few, had a few dozen voices sorry, that we had recorded and from that, we were able to create these unique voices. But if the voices aren't similar to the person you want to make the voice for, you don't get a very um, good match in terms of how the voice is going to sound. So we wanted, we had this vision of getting the voices from people um, around the world, people with different accents and ages and groups and so on, so that we could have a variety of voices from which we could create unique voices. So the voice. A recording platform looks much like what you're looking at now. It's a virtual recording studio in which there is a console. And on that console, there are a series of sentences that have been specifically designed so that we can capture all the sounds and sound combinations in the language. And as you say these various different sentences, there's a projection on the back wall that shows the different consonants and vowels. And those consonants and vowels are, the, are those that make up the English language. And as you say each sentence, different sounds light up. And we bank, um, over time, a variety of the different combinations of the language so that we have all the sound combinations so we can create sounds and words that were not said before. Um, so this is the Human Voice Bank platform. And from this platform, we have been collecting a variety of voices from people all over the world. There are currently 12,000 voice donors from around the world who have been contributing. This map that you're looking at are where these people are from. And these are everyday people who are wanting to contribute their voice to help those who are, um, who are in need. And you can see a variety. Most of these people are coming from North America and Europe and parts of um, Australia. Um, but also lots of other parts of the world. We are currently only in English, but we have been trying to get more and more people to contribute even with accents so that we have this whole variety of voices. We've got people on the platform from 6 all the way up to, um, to 91. So there's a huge range here, and it's great because that allows us to create this whole uh, amazing texture of the voices that we can create. So just kind of uh, wrapping back to sort of the technology part, what we need from someone who want to create a unique voice in the bespoke voice way is you take two seconds or so of, of a sustained sound and from the person that you want to make the voice for. Then you search through the database uh, and find somebody who's closest to them in age and gender and culture and lo location, really, um, who has recorded about six to eight hours of speech through that voice banking platform that I just showed you. And you can combine the two together to create this unique voice. And so there's two real um, kinds of ways we can make a voice. For someone who's unable to make much speech at all or isn't able to speak because they have a severe communication impairment, we call those voices bespoke voices because we're going to take that short sample of voice and combine it with someone in the voice bank. And let me just play you a couple of samples of um, uh, of an individual where this is what we got from them in terms of their sound sample. Um, can you play that sound, Anna Maria? We won't be able to play it through the PowerPoint, no. Do you have it on okay. the file? I can open it on a file. Let me just uh, do that. Okay, so here's the individual sound. So that's 
oh, that we were able to get from this one person who's an AAC user. She's a young girl. She's nine years old. And here's a voice sample um, of someone who was a matched speaker for her that we found from the voice bank who we're going to combine that awe sample with hers from. Giving your voice can change lives. Okay, so now you've got these two voice samples. As you blend them together and you create a synthesized voice, you get a voice like this. I feel happy. My name is Maeve. Okay, so there's a variety of different, so what we've done here is taken the sounds that, that the young girl can make and blended them with somebody who is similar to her in age and gender and created that synthesized voice. So that's what this book is. What a vocal legacy is in, um, is if you are able to bank your own voice, then we can create a voice for you from your own recording. So here, now I'm going to play you a sample of um, somebody who is who has been able to bank their voice prior to them losing their voice. So this is an individual who you'll hear the original recordings, and then you'll hear the voice that was created from those original recordings between PowerPoint. So here's the original recording. What have you been doing? And notice his accent. Tell me about your family. OK, so those are the original recordings. And now I'm going to play you some samples of his voice that we've synthesized through our vocal legacy process. Hello, this is my new voice. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. And so that's, that's how we create the vocal legacy if there's enough speech from us, you have, from the individual who we want to make the voice for. OK, so I'm going to just go back to this presentation again. Hopefully that gives you an idea of um, the way the voices are created. And at the end of the presentation, I'll play you a video of the process as well. Okay, so uh, we have, currently we have seven people who we've delivered our voices to. These were our Trailblazer users. Uh, we created these seven voices in December of 2015, and um, here are some of the testimonials we have from those people who've been using their voices since then. For one individual, um, she, uh, her therapist has noticed um, an increase. We did some pre and post measures of the voice use, and what we saw is that prior to um, her using her personalized voice, the level of communication, initiation, and participation um, was a lot less than it is now. It's now 300% more. In other words, if she was raising her hand two or three times during the session, she's raising her hand upwards of you know, 18 or 19 times now. It's, it's an incredible amount of, uh, of change. I think it was 6 to 18 was the difference there. Um, other things is when the first time, for example, Sarah heard her voice, she said, it sounds funky. These are not the kinds of words that people often use to talk about their assistive voice. Max's father said, you know, when he heard his voice, he heard his son's voice, he said, oh, it sounds like Max. It sounds like compassionate, just like he is. Um, a gentleman named John, who we made a voice for, who had lost his voice to ALS, who also we went through the bespoke process with, um, he when he first heard the two samples of the that voice he created, the first couple, he, he politely sort of nodded and said, yeah, that sounds like me. And he heard his third, the third sample that we created, his entire body went into shakes, thinking, you know, indicating that he was hearing himself again for the first time in eight years. So I think it's really powerful what the voice can do. It's clearly still a synthetic voice, so you have to keep that in mind, um, that, you know, with all the advances we're making, we have been able to create a voice that's from just a couple of samples of their voice and at this price point, but um, it doesn't mean it's going to sound like an impersonation of someone. So just, you know, to keep those things in mind as well. We currently have 86 pre-orders for 2016 um, and are seeking uh, additional pre-orders for people who are wanting to build the voice um, for themselves or for their loved ones. Uh, so, so far, what's gotten us to this point is, um, is money through the, or funding through the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. They've allowed us to take the technology, which in the laboratory was taking us somewhere between um, 40 to 50 hours to create each voice, obviously prohibitive in terms of scaling this, um, and also 
hundreds of thousands of dollars or at least tens of thousands of dollars to produce. In one year, we've been able to bring that down to somewhere between six to eight hours of manual time. It's still expensive for us to build voices, um, and yet it, it still makes it far more achievable in terms of um, accessible to the public. It's a new technology, though, and in every new technology, there is a, a time period where uh, we need to have early adopters who want to support this and want to see this come to fruition. Last year, we ran an Indiegogo campaign for many people who um, contributed to that and also helped us get that first funding together to create those first seven voices. Um, and we've been featured in a number of really exciting press venues that have helped us tell the story, mostly for us to get more people donating on our voice banking platform, but also to allow us this technology to be known to more people around the world. Um, we've been given some awards um, and, and have mentorship um, uh, mentorship through different kinds of organizations, including accelerator programs and um, such as Math Challenge and Thai Scale Up. And now we're at the point where we are about to launch the product um, and also are seeking um, outside investors to, to launch the company. So I think I'll, I'll take that as uh, wrapping up to, um, to this. And I know that there are going to be more questions in um, the chat. Um, and um, I've got a few questions here that I have listed in, and so I'm going to take some of these um, in order, and then um, what I'll do is go back to the chat and see if there's additional questions that don't suffice in terms of the answers that I have for these. So uh, the first question I see on my list here is, how much does a vocal ID voice cost? Um, and so I'll just put up this slide right now. Um, a cur currently, a vocal ID voice costs um, $1,249 for us to build the voice. And we have an annual subscription that's $240 for us to allow it to continue to be available on the various different iOS, Android, and Windows platforms that are constantly evolving. It's, it's costly for all the changes that are happening. In addition, we have plans for um, ways in which we can evolve the voice um, over time as well. So if you build a voice for a nine-year-old today, how do you grow that voice for later? So um, we partnered with uh, some key assistive technology companies, uh, such as Toby Dynavox, Frankie Romick, Speak for Yourself, Lynn Grafka. These companies, um, as an initial starting point, but are looking to have uh, additional partners um, in this in this uh, group as well. Um, and so the voices will work on a variety of different platforms. Um, I hope that answers some of the questions around this. If you have other questions around this, please email us at hello at vocalid.co. Um, the next question here I see is what type of funding sources are available to, I guess, to fund the voice? Um, and what we saw initially, I mean, currently, um, the, our voices are an out-of-pocket expense. And we are working on ways in which we can get um, insurance to cover this, but insurance, it's a bit of a um, chicken and egg in the sense that you need to make sure that you have enough proof points about the technology before you can get that kind of coverage. It's years, and by that time, you know, um, we have to actually prove that this is, there is a market for this and that there are people willing and interested in this technology. So we're pursuing insurance, but at the moment, we need to have support from people who believe that this technology needs to exist. Um, and so it is an out-of-pocket expense. It is $1,249. We've priced it at a point where, um, where you know, we're just trying to get people to use our technology. Um, and what we found is the online fundraisers that, we, that pe we've helped people do, either through GoFundMe or through Indiegogo, uh, Life, and a variety of different methods, people have been able to raise money very quickly. So in fact, Max's campaign that raised 10, 000, over $10,000 was done in 22 hours. Um, and so, and Leo's campaign was also very quick for the $1,249 that he was trying to raise. So um, there are many organizations also, community organizations that can help. United States Apology of Boston, for example, has actually helped us fund some voices for people in the community as well. Um, so there are a, a variety of different ways in which people can get their voices, um, can get the funds for the voice as well. Um, in terms of uh, one other question I see here is on how um, can I help spread the word? 
Um, so, you know, we have a number of people this summer that we are accepting into our fellowship program to help us get more people to contribute their voice. So when someone contributes their voice, they can get certificates of appreciation um, or completion that can be used for uh, community service hours. So there's a variety of different ways in which um, people can help us spread the word about voice donation as well as um, getting, uh, having people get voices who need voices. So I'm going to turn the, actually the webcam on at this moment um, and see if um, I can answer any other questions that people may have. Um, let's see. How do I do that? Anna Marie, I don't see the webcam again. Oh, there we go. Okay. A couple other questions I have on here is my computer may not be the best device to get clear recording. Are there recording studios that you're partnered with um, to get higher quality recording? We aren't partnered with other recording studios, um, but there are many people who are um, recording in um, a home studio or sometimes even recording in a, a quiet room with like that's padded, for example, um, a, uh, even a, a walk-in closet can work relatively well. Um, as long as your computer has a, um, you, you can put in a headset microphone, that usually is very effective. Um, can you, uh, here's another question I'm seeing here from Jackie. Um, can you clarify what it means by capturing an individual's voice quality? Sure. An individual's voice quality, um, there are many things that make our voices unique. So the pitch of your voice, the loudness of your voice, the breathiness of the voice. Um, all of these are actually uh, signals that are produced by the larynx. And so there are ways in which we capture, when we record someone's sound just saying ah, or sustained ah production, we actually get a lot of information about their voice from that. Um, I hope that answers your question, Jackie. Um, why do you think Stephen Hawking, Ken asks, why do you think Stephen Hawking still uses a speech device with a voice that dates to the earlier days? I think for, um, for Dr. Hawking, I think the thing is that voice has become his voice. It's become part of his identity. And, um, and, and it's, it's hard. And so I, it's hard for him to change and doesn't want to change it. And there are going to be people like that. So I don't think that every person who uses a speech generating device is necessarily going to want a custom voice um, because they've started associating that voice that they've been using with themselves. But it, should they have been given a choice earlier in their in life um, about having a, a custom voice, that probably would have been an option they would choose so that they wouldn't sound much like everyone else. In fact, John and Linda have a very interesting story about this. John's been using the Ryan voice for the last eight years on his assistive communication device. And they talk about it as being a third person in their relationship. Um, you know, and that when they were waiting to get their, their vocal ID voice, um, it was really sort of about regaining that connection to one another, not having this third voice in the midst of all of it. So, um, so Joy, um, Joy asked the question, that, are you aware of any research studies that discuss adoption rates of AAC? Yeah, so there are some studies on the adoption rate in AAC, but they're not, you know, we don't have concrete reasons for why people don't adopt or, or abandon the AAC devices. Um, we don't, I think what we don't know is um, what are the reasons and also if you don't know of uh, new technological trends that are coming down the pike, then uh, it's hard to predict why someone hasn't adopted that piece of the, the current state of technology. Um, okay, uh, let me see. I'm going to just write down. Um, will it? So Jessica asked this question: Will a user's custom voice change or be blended with different donors as the user ages? That's a great question. Um, what we think about the voice as having sort of four stages. Uh, a child stage, an adolescent stage, um, an adult stage, and a mature stage. And so within those bands, uh, we believe that there's ways for us to transform the voice. And that's what some of the R&D that we're investing in heavily right now is how do we make that, those, those voice adaptations. 
But as you know, as someone goes from childhood to becoming an adult or a teen, um, there's a huge jump. And so in that huge jump, it may be the same person or it may be um, a, a different individual. But you know, what we want to do is have that be seamless. It may also be that initially they chose someone whose voice was soft and, and you know, similar to theirs, but as, they, as their own voice changed, they preferred a voice that was deeper or louder or whatever. And so sometimes I think preference plays just as much of a role as fit. So one of the things that we're doing now is when we create the voices, um, we learned some really important lessons in delivering our first seven voices. What we learned is we created three voice options for each individual in our first set. And the reason we had done that is because we didn't have a way to know exactly um, what it is that they would, they would want. Um, so we created these three different options, and um, we played them the voice options. And sometimes they preferred ones that were not necessarily the clearest, but were the ones that somehow they affiliated with. So now what we're doing is once the person has given us their voice sample, we find the match uh, or the matches in their database, and we offer them one of three different choices. Um, we are going to offer them one of three different choices of who they want to be blended with. So it's not only their voice, but it's also their choice about who they want to be blended with. That's very important. The other thing we've learned in, in the delivery of the first set of trailblazer voices is that sometimes the voices that are chosen by individuals who use AAC tend to have a slower speaking rate. So you and I may speak at fast speaking rates um, and may prefer faster voices, but those who use AAC devices may have auditory comprehension impairments or may just prefer slower voices. Um, and so everyone has a difference in their preferences as well as in sort of what fits them. Um, let me see if I can find another question here. Ah. So there's another question here. Do you only use recordings from one Mac speaker or several? Currently, our process is to use recordings from just one Mac speaker. Um, there are interesting uh, ideas there in terms of how to use data from multiple people. But what you hear is jumpy sounding voices. And so um, our goal is to make a voice sound very clear and understandable, but also authentic. And that's actually a relatively hard thing to do with very little data from the recipient. Um, and also, in relatively speaking, very little data even from our voice donors. So Siri was made with hundreds of hours of speech and cost millions of dollars to produce. Right? What we're trying to do is take six to eight hours of speech from someone who's non-speaking and have them, um, you know, sorry, someone who is able to speak and have then create a voice that is um, understandable and that's unique to them. So we're trying to push the envelope on the amount of speech we need and how quickly we can make this happen. Tom, I see a question from you um, about partnering with NPR and their affiliate stations to capture voices. So in fact, we were just um, I was giving a uh, talk the other day, uh, sorry, a, a doing an interview at WGBH here in Boston. And I was talking to the sound engineer to figure out are there ways in which we can use booths and booth times um, when in the downtime. And in many places, some of our volunteer organizations that we've been working with have allowed us access to the university um, booths or to the, the you know, audiology booths and different private practices. So the more sound recording studios that we can use, the better. But quite honestly, technology for the recording has gotten so much cheaper and better that even a cell phone, um, although we, we don't have our voice uh, recording samples, um, we don't gather them off the phone. And the reason is because when people are on the phone, they tend to do this kind of thing. The microphone's on one side. And what happens is as you continue to rotate your phone or change the, um, the distance from your phone to your mouth, you're actually going to change the clarity of the recording. So, um, we ideally, if you can record in a, in a sound recording studio, that's great. Uh, but that's not going to be the, the breaking factor in terms of us creating a high quality voice today. Um, we're not. We're seeing that even people, when they record from home, from home with a headset microphone in a quiet room, can have a good quality recording. Um, 
but it does need to be quiet, and it does need to be done in a way that um, complies with all the things that we ask people to do. Okay. Um, how, so Dr. Milligan, you asked, how can I identify people who need help in my area? Do you have a list of people who need voices and can't afford them? Um, currently, we don't have a list of people who need voices and can't afford them. And if, um, if there are ways, if, you know, you can always get, can have those people get on, of our, on our wait list and, um, and indicate that they are funding for themselves or, um, in other words, would want a voice but can't afford one right now. During our Indiegogo campaign, we ran um, a variety, another campaign where we asked, you know, if people had financial need, we were able to, uh, to help them along um, in that way. What we're doing though right now at scale, um, we, we must show that we, we have enough customers to get this off the ground. So um, there are many other funding vehicles available. So we hope that if you do know of people, please let them know about it and see if there can be any community-based sort of organizations that we can um, get to, to help us get this moving along. Um, Ashley, um, Ashley asks, to donate a voice, do I need to purchase a special kind of microphone? Yes, Ashley, if you don't have to purchase a special type of microphone, but there is a microphone that we recommend, and that microphone um, is a Logitech microphone, and you can find this information on our website. Um, and it's also, if you, if you need more information, you can find that, um, if you email us at hello at vocalid.ca, we'll send that to you too. Um, Okay, let me see. I'm trying to race through some of these, look through some of these other emails, uh, these chats. How do people, I think I already covered this question about uh, how do people access more personalized voices, i.e. Medicare, Medicaid. Um, okay, Shannon asked, for legacy, he sounded English, uh, pre-recorded than uh, pre-recorded than more Australian. After, <laughs> um, so Shannon recognized a difference in accent before and after of uh, the gentleman. Um, he's actually Scottish, so maybe he's somewhere in between. Um, there aren't there. It's not about vowel distortions, but we're trying to create recreate his speech from just 3,500 sentences, and so there are sort of some approximations of speech that are happening there, um, which is why I was talking earlier about the fact that um, it is still synthesized speech, um, but it is one where um, we're getting closer to what the, per the likeness of the individual. Um, okay. Ah, so Creighton asks, if a recipient has old recordings of their voice and can no longer speak, can old recordings be used? So this question actually came up yesterday as well. I've been, we have a number of people with uh, degenerative conditions who did not bank their voice um, and who are unable to actually even make sound now in the case of many people with ALS. And um, our current process requires either that we have a two-second long sample, which we're probably not going to be able to get a sustained sample like that in a pre-recorded sample um, of like a telephone record, like a message recording or a video or something like that, um, or it requires us to bank the voice on our platform. There's ways to do it, and in fact, we have applied for some funding um, in order to try to take that what we call found audio and use our same processes on it. But we don't have the funding currently um, or the capacity to actually do that, um, although we would love to do that. So if we were able to get additional funding, that would be one of the first things that we would attack is how do we take found audio and use the bespoke process on that. I think it would be, be wonderful um, for so many people. Um, it really, right now, we have funding through the government for the R&D necessary to really get this first two products out, which is a lot on our plate with a with an extremely dedicated team. Um, and uh, but you know we can't tackle all the problems at once, and we need significant funding to take on these newer um, kinds of R and D. But they're not none of these things are, are really rocket science. They're within our reach, and we're capable of doing it. Um, 
um, let's see. We still have another 15 minutes or so, so I'm just going to check down to some of these questions. Um, have any members of the deaf community expressed an interest in receiving a custom voice? That's asked by Sue. Um, there are actually some people who uh, lost their speech, um, sorry, lost their hearing later in life. Uh, but this is text to speech, and so um, you know I haven't heard of people who um, have wanted a voice that have um, lost their hearing. But there are a number of people who have lost their vision later in life who have expressed an interest in wanting a custom voice because they rely on screen reading technology and currently even screen readers have very generic sounding voices and so um, they, what, what some of these people claim is that when they hear their voice, um, when they hear their own writing from a screen reader that is a generic sounding voice, they feel like they don't have that inner writing voice. And so they would prefer to have a custom voice instead. Um, now, our email address, so um, John asked, uh, did you leave off an M in your email address or in the company address? No. Um, our URL for the company is vocalid.co. Um, dot com was taken, and so we are dot co. Many startups actually have shorter other or different kinds of URLs. So if you're emailing us or if you're looking for us on the website, it's vocalid.co. Um, okay, Candice says, there are many students at school that could really benefit from the technology for communicating their ideas. That's wonderful, Candice, and if we could help us, help us get the word to, uh, to those uh, students and, and their families, it would be wonderful. One of the things that we've been doing is um, working with some of the special education schools uh, and organizations that work with them to see if we can, um, we can do some, uh, a number of pilot studies um, or pilot programs to get a number of kids in that school to have a voice. So here in the Boston area, there's a school called the Cotty School that we've been working with where three of the kids have our custom digital voices. And what we see is really the interaction with those kids um, with one another, those students with one another, is just fascinating. You know, two children in that class or two students in that school, one nine and one sixteen, have the exact same voice, and now they all have different voices, and that really has been very empowering for them. Um, okay, so. I think I've gone through all the other questions. Is there, are there any other further questions? I think we have some more questions. Um, can voice donors oh, be no. family members, such as siblings, if the individual has limited speech sounds? Oh, sorry, I didn't scroll down. Tell, um, <laughs> tell me that question again. Can voice donors be family members, such as a sibling, if the individual has limited speech sounds? Yeah. Um, so a voice donor um, can be anyone. And you know, although sometimes siblings, um, you know, people are motivated by helping their sibling, I think that's wonderful. The thing is, siblings aren't always the best match because the the, vocal, the uh, lung capacity of someone who is unable to speak or even the posture sometimes because if they're in a wheelchair, those things will affect their voice. And so um, although siblings are great, you know, they may be a match for somebody else, but even identical twins don't often have the exact same voice. We, we, I think we have this preconceived notion that thinking that siblings, um, people in the family aren't all going to sound the same because we got confused with our brothers or sisters growing up. but. Um, it's not always the case that a sibling will necessarily be a good match. And that's why our algorithm, well, obviously we'll put that in, the, in the, uh, the sibling's recordings if we have them, will be in the pool of people from which we can select. But um, we look at a bunch of different characteristics for the match. Some things include gender, uh, age, location, and so on, but also voice quality. So we have created um, a voice taxonomy. That is um, a variety. Everyone has a unique voice, but we can kind of group them into a set of different voices based on, voice types based on uh, pitch and 
loudness and breathiness and, and nasality or the locus of, of resonance. Um, and this helps us figure out some of what the best matches are for an individual. So it's great to get siblings involved because I think beyond just sort of getting them to do, do something for their, um, for their sibling who has a, a assistive communication needs, it's a great way to build empathy, but um, they may not necessarily be the match. Um, I see another uh, one here. How do, you, how do you address prosodic features of speech? Is that possible, or will the voice still sound relatively monotone? Yeah, so that's a great question. So how to, addressing prosodic aspects of speech, these are the changes in pitch and loudness and intonation. Um, the, that's really the basis of, uh, of my research. And a lot of what we were finding is that the prosodic aspects of someone who is non-speaking um, are actually relatively preserved. So we capture those, but you'll hear that uh, synthesized speech still lacks intonation. It's, it's work that we're working on. We have some visual spatial ways in which we can indicate prosody um, that we'd love to build into uh, the voices. But um, there is still, there's still work to be done along sort of the emotional aspects of the voice. So step one, let us, let's, help. let's get to making it sound authentic. Step two, and clear still. Step two, let's work on the, in, in the intonation and the emotional aspects, because that's a little bit more slippery. Um, OK, so Deborah, I see a question from you. Uh, while recording my sentences, I sometimes get warnings about volume, et cetera. And messages say, don't, uh, say not to worry. We'll re-record the problem sentences at the end. Typically, how much re-recording is needed? Yeah, so those, that, we have some online methods for how we are testing and making sure that your recordings are of the quality that we need to create a voice. Um, you know, you need to have, because we're crowdsourcing this, we have people recording anywhere. Um, and sometimes people forget that they've got the air conditioner on or they've got, you know, um, the heat blowing or whatever it may be. Um, or just something aberrant happens, you know, someone walks into the room as you do the recording. So the, the re-recording is done in cases where um, we just didn't get a, sound enough, a good enough recording that we have to do it again. It, the, how to often does it happen, it really depends on just the recording context in which someone is recording. So as long as you're in a quiet room and have a headset microphone on, um, it should be fine. Um, but you are going to get that once in a while, and we will kind of recycle those sentences again so that we capture them. The sentences are ordered um, so that we're capturing some of the most important sentences first. But uh, that means if you make some errors, we're going to have to recycle those again and get that. Um, Again, I want to stress that you know making a good sounding synthesized voice depends on the quality of the recordings that we initially get. Um, Ken asks, what is the format of these voice files? Can they be used with any speech generating device or just specific ones? The voices that we're building are compatible on all the different platforms. Um, with, so all seven uh, voices that we deployed in 2015 were on Windows platforms. Um, and uh, Android, uh, the voices work on Android as well. And we're currently in the process of uh, our voices also work on the iOS platform. For iOS, you have to integrate with each app. And so that's what we're doing is we're starting off with a handful of apps um, so that we don't have new deployment for all. Um, again, this is just a, a resource um, question at the moment. I think that uh, if, I, if, you, if anyone has any other questions, I'm happy to take them, or please email us at hello at vocalid.co. Thank you.